this week on the Back Table Podcast. I'd say on average, we're treating somewhere between three and six blood vessels. And, and it's dynamic too. So while you're doing the procedure, like you, you use your initial run as like your roadmap or, your, your, you know, what you're basing your decisions off of. But things can change. New formations can open up. Like you can see a middle rectal after you embolize this because the now the flow is coming from there. You're like, oh, I didn't think I had to treat a middle rectal, but now it looks like it's very prominent when I'm injecting here. It's lighting up over there. So some of it is like a, an art form. Like you may see it and it's it's a, like a tiny wisp and I'll just be like, I'll leave it alone. But if they have some recurrence or, or they don't do as well as I suspect, I'll keep that in my back of my mind. Like, yeah, they're probably have a middle rectal that's significantly contributing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a brief message from our sponsor. Boston Scientific can help you advance, connect, and equip your practice with Next Lab. Next Lab is a suite of solutions and partnerships tailored to meet the needs of your OBL or cardiovascular ASC. Next Lab goes beyond Boston Scientific's medical devices to provide ways to reduce expenses and increase efficiencies in your business so you can focus on patient care. Whether you have an established lab or you're thinking about opening one, Boston Scientific can help. Visit bostonscientific.com forward slash Next Lab. And now back to the show. Today I have a great episode. I've been looking forward to it since SIR discussing treatment algorithms uh, and really a 101 for everybody on hemorrhoid embolization. We recently discussed collaborating on outpatient procedures with GI docs, uh, including Sonny, we had Sonny Bagel and Jerry Tan on the show, which I know you're familiar with, Alex. Uh, today, um, I am happy to hang out with Alex Poetapa. Poetapa. Alex Poetapa. The V is like a W, yeah. Okay. Where's that from, Alex? It's Thai. So thai, I'm half okay. Thai, half Italian. <laughs> half Thai, half Italian. Poetapa. Alex and I got to hang out at SIR with Sonny Bagla and their whole entourage, which I love. I love seeing Bagla's entourage <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> you got was, a little entourage too, I though. I do have a little entourage now. <laughs> it's great. I love it. And so we it's got, good time. We, yeah, we got, it was good. It was fun times. It was, it was just great to go to a conference and, and see everybody. I, I know you guys go to a lot of conferences, you know, with, um, you guys are re- recruiting and, and speaking and, and, and so forth, but it, it was my first big one in a while. And, um, it was just great to see so many people that I hadn't seen in a long time, you know? That was awesome. Um, I think the location was actually really good too. There was, everything was like condensed downtown there. So, yeah. um, you could, you know, see some, uh, presentations pop over for lunch. We had some really good pizza at this pizzeria Bianco that we saw on Netflix. It was great. Oh, you saw that on Netflix? That's how you found that place? Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, so Alex, for those who don't- Yeah, so I initially trained, well, I actually did my intern year in Arizona, U of A in Tucson. So I actually knew Phoenix pretty well. My wife's from Phoenix, but um, I went back to UMass um, for a residency, diagnostic radiology residency um, from Massachusetts originally. Uh, It was great training there. Stayed on there for fellowship. Uh, and then stayed on as faculty for a short while before joining Sunny at Prostate Centers slash IR Centers slash Hemorrhoid Centers. Been there for about oh, almost two years. Um, things have been going great. Yeah, so we've all just been kind of watching this IR Centers, Hemorrhoid Centers, GI, you know, what Prostate Centers all unfold. And, you know, that was the first time where I saw you guys, you know, before I just knew it as Prostate Centers. But can you give our audience a little, just for people who, hey, we have a lot of training listeners. They might be looking for jobs, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Uh, give us an overview of like what the practice looks like, you know, because you guys are opening centers throughout the country. Throughout the country. Sunny's always on the go. I'm actually in Boston right now. I'm going to be working at one of our centers for a couple of days here. But basically what it is, it's a, it's a management service company where we partner with different practices and we basically provide IR services for them. So it may be partnering with the urology practice where we're PAE heavy or partnering with a GI practice where we're hemorrhoid artery embolization heavy. We also have a practice opening that's more MSK heavy, partnering with a more of a orthopedic practice. Um, so it actually works really well. Um, it's very collaborative. The patients end up getting the best care. There's no pushing 
you know, okay, I'm an IR, we're only going to do this. Every patient gets a PAE or every patient gets a hem and bow. It's much more collaborative and the treatment is tailored to the patient, but you can follow an algorithm when everybody's, you know, playing together in the sandbox, if you would. Yeah. Yeah. And we were, when we were hanging out at SIR, I got to talk to you and study a lot about it, about the practice model. And, and what I love about it is the fact is all the training that you guys provide. So even if somebody like myself, who hasn't done a lot of PAE or hemorrhoid or, or I, I, you know, a little bit of GAE there, you know, Sonny's like, Hey, th- we're going to train you. You're going to spend at least a month with us doing cases and you're going to get enough cases under your belt where you would know how to do this and it becomes your better. Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely a ramp up period. I'd say with, um, PAE, it's a, there's more nuances because the anatomy is so variable and the angles can be challenging. But even with hem embo, it's, it's a different tactile feel. You're you're using the wire and catheter in a way that you don't typically use in other parts of the body because you're doing that like 180 degree turn off that IMA, and then like the wire can kind of whip if you if you use it too much. So it's it's a delicate dance between you micro catheter and micro wire yeah um with the hem embos well we'll jump into that um let's talk a little bit about hemorrhoid so i want this this episode to be kind of a hemorrhoid embolization 101 you know it's not something like we learned about really in uh residency i mean <laughs> you know no, totally it's, it's a yeah. new it's it's new it's a new innovation and so i want you to tell us first overview of the disease process how these patients are typically presenting and then we'll get into like how they're how you're getting these referrals. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's obviously very prevalent. I think it's yeah peak peak age is probably somewhere between forty five and sixty five. It impacts a good amount of the population, up to five percent of the population. There's no real sex preference aside from one subset of like young pregnant women. Fifty percent of Americans will have hemorrhoids by the age of fifty some degree, whether it's internal, external. And the treatment options aren't great for a variety of reasons. Um, Banding can have a high recurrence rate, upwards of 49%. Hemorrhoidectomy or surgery, if you talk to anyone who's ever had that, it's one of the most painful recoveries from a surgery. You'll even have a lot of colorectal uh, surgeons, and I've spoken to colorectal surgeons in their office, They'll say, I don't want to send this person. Like, they have to really fail all the other treatments before I, I'll, I'll take him for hemorrho- hemorrhoidectomy because it is such a painful recovery and they, they hate it afterwards. There's uh, cryotherapy, but what what hemorrhoid artery embolization was basically based off of is Doppler guided ligation, where they basically use Doppler, identify the artery, and they suture, suture the artery, block off the artery. So we're basically taking that a step further and doing that from the inside. So how we find our patients or how patients present to us, I'd say 75% of them are coming through the GI practice, but a good 25% of patients are coming on their own. They're just Googling it and saying, hey, I heard you guys do offer this treatment. It's the type of disease process like when you talk to patients, they've struggled with, they may have struggled this with, for a long time in their in their life and they're either one embarrassed about seeking treatment not knowing that treatment options are there or they don't like the treatment options or they fail the other treatment options um so it's it's kind of offering a service to a population that is kind of underserved right now yeah i mean are people traveling to find you guys because i i imagine there's not that many totally. irs out there doing this you know and so when next the next week or the week after they're coming up from Miami for for the procedure. So yeah, they're they're coming from all over. But yeah, so what what patient's the right patient? There's different symptoms that they'll present with. I think the ideal patient, if you're just getting started and you want to have like um, objective success that you're going to be able to say, okay, I did a good job, is bleeding patients because that's something easy to tell. They're bleeding. They're not bleeding. We are our, our all the literature and our literature shows that all the symptoms improve. Um, the goal of your prolapse score grade improves, pain, itching, discomfort improves as well. But those are, are somewhat subjective when you're asking the patients. But the bleeding is, is something that, you know, if you're just getting into it, you can tell, okay, I did, I did well for this patient. And 
then kind of take on some of those other patients. Yeah. So can we, uh, I want to back up for a, a minute and just talk about, okay, you got those referrals coming in, most of which are coming from GI because mm -hmm. for whatever reason, you know, they've already kind of selected this patient out saying these, the other options we have aren't great for this pr patient. We want to send them mm -hmm. to IR. So the patient comes to your clinic, you know, can you talk us through, yeah, what questions are you asking them? Is there a grading system? And then what's, yep. what's the physical exam like? Cause I think that's something that people yeah. aren't comfortable with. If you know what yeah, I mean. yeah. Well, trust me, I hadn't done a <laughs> rectal exam since like med school. So yeah, um, but now I do it like every day. So, uh, <laughs> um, so they come to the office. We'll we'll have them change. Usually, they, if they've come from the GI for rectal bleeding, they've had a colonoscopy. So because you want to rule out, like especially in you know patient, you want to rule out like cancer or any other reason why they would be bleeding. But it's it's usually bright red blood when they go to the bathroom. They can see it when they wipe, or they may even see it in the toilet bowl, may even see it in their underwear, and you're pretty sure that it's going to be hemorrhoids. But questions that I ask them is, okay, do you have bleeding? And if you do have bleeding, what it describe the severity, the frequency, prolapse. So that, that goes into the grading score. Um, so it's, it's one through four. So one would be bleeding without necessarily prolapse. Two would be bleeding with prolapse, but it spontaneously reduces. Three would be bleeding, but the prolapse needs to be manually reduced. And then four would be prolapse that doesn't reduce. So usually fours, like I'm, I'm hesitant to treat the fours because you, they're usually so far gone that even if they do get shrinkage, it might not be enough that, that they notice significantly. And those are the ones that will typically send to colorectal surgery. However, sometimes they can't have surgery because they're on blood thinners or whatever and we'll we'll do them on occasion and they do they do improve but it's just the degree in which they shrink down is i think it's probably a variety of factors some of it probably has to do with you know their age and the resiliency of their tissue and recoil and whatnot but um yeah so those are that would be the grading system i usually add, like give them a little um background on what hemorrhoids are and kind of how they occur because it's important for them to understand that because going forward, this procedure will fix or help their hemorrhoids that they have now, but it doesn't mean that they can't form new ones in the future. Or, you know, there's a difference between treatment failure and recurrence of disease. So, I mean, I, I give them a whole spiel about, you know, there's, there are these fibrovascular cushions um, that the internal hemorrhoids are these fibrovascular cushions that aid in uh, fecal continence. There's usually these three prominent cushions, so you'll, that will be important when you're doing the exam, so you'll feel, yeah, you usually have them in right lateral to cutis position, you know, just feel, let's see, on, on a clock. So uh, there'll be like one behind you and then two like anterior lateral, uh, if you will. And then, um, yeah, so I'll feel for that, check to see if there's any external hemorrhoids. So the external hemorrhoids will arise distal to the dentate line. So it'll be like on the skin essentially. Patients oftentimes will come in with a thrombosed external hemorrhoid and they're like, this is so painful. Usually when they say this is so painful, it's not really bleeding much, but it's so painful. Like I'll talk to them on the phone and they're like, yeah, it's probably an external hemorrhoid. Um, with those, it's usually more conservative treatment, um, but the, the hemorrhoid embolization does help with that. But I, I make sure they understand that, you know, causes for hemorrhoids. So causes may be chronic constipation, chronic diarrhea, sitting on the toilet for too long like that that's co very common um, with everyone you know with the iphone ipad whatever people used to bring books magazines whatever whatever they do in there but pregnancy and uh, childbirth we talked about and some of it's kind of just genetic but yeah if they don't clear up those causes then the likelihood of them having recurrence afterwards is going to be higher so i i really try to educate them before the procedure. So it's not something afterwards of like, oh, hey, it worked for six months, but, or a year, and now I have symptoms back. I was like, well, how have your bowel habits been? It's like, yeah, I go to the bathroom, I'm constipated, I go maybe once every five days. I was like, oh, well, that'll yeah, do it. That'll do it, yeah, okay. All right, well, thank you for that. That was a great overview. And so I wanna jump into, once you determine that it's an appropriate patient for embolization, what, what's that conversation? I mean, you already kind of told, told us what they can um, expect in terms of, you know, or you lay out the treatment options for them, right? The chances are they've already, they're not a good candidate for, for other 
symptoms by the time they come to you. What if it's somebody that found you via internet? Do you have them see your GI colleague before you elect to do an embolization? They don't have to be like, if, cause if they're so far away, like if they're coming from Miami, but that one actually happened to be in a sister practice. But if they're far away, I'll just say, say get a colonoscopy, um, with, with your, with your gastroenterologist, whoever your local gastroenterologist is. But if they're local, I'll refer them to one of our gastroenterologists to get Got a it. colonoscopy if it's bleeding, yeah. um, if bleeding yeah. is their predominant symptom. Got it. Okay. So you want to check that box first. And then, okay, so let's move forward. They're, they're a candidate for hemorrhoid embolization. What's that conversation with like in terms of, okay, here's the risks, potential complications, and then this is what you can expect for the procedure and, and to follow? The yeah, so I mean, it's, basically. Yeah, so risk, it's going to be pretty standard, the bleeding infection risk. We, I do talk to them about non-target, but in all the papers in our experience, there hasn't been any clinical significant um, ischemia um, related to embolization. Now that could be different if you're working like, so now you're getting into anatomy. We had our anatomy paper. That's what I presented at SIR, but you can have contributions from the middle rectal artery. So anytime you're, you're go working off the internal iliac, I, I mean, there's always chances of, you know, distal emboli going to other places like penis and skin and, and whatnot. We haven't had any of those patients, but you know, in theory, if, if you're treating in that area, that could happen. Okay. So non-target embolization being the key thing that you want to counsel them on. And so let's, let's walk through. So day of, you know, they come in for the procedure, tell us, walk us through a typical hemorrhoid embolization. Yeah. So patient comes in, checks in with our scheduler. We bring him back. They change. I talk to them. I go over the procedure again briefly. There's just going to be one tiny pinch from the numbing medicine. After that, the procedure is painless for them. They're laying flat. That can be a little uncomfortable, but the procedure itself is so quick. Usually it's about 20 to 60 minutes. We use a closure device, so they're staying with us for two hours afterwards. We go femoral, especially for the hemorrhoids. Is it they conscious do sedation? stay for two hours. Yeah, we use uh, fentanyl bursit. Yeah, and then we'll, yeah, we'll give them a Valium beforehand too, just to to um, take the edge off. Have you guys ever done it radio? I mean, if you think about it, UFEs are done radio and it's kind of go, you know, internal iliac and so forth, but any reason to yeah, do femoral so, versus radial? The, the IMA might be difficult. Um, I got it. Got it. Radial, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, we always do femoral. PAE will do radial occasionally, but we, at that we actually predominantly do femoral as well. Got it. So, fe so yeah, femoral, and then closure device. Are you guys using like Minx or what? It uh, we actually use Perclose. Perclose. Um, okay. And but backup, I'll use like an Angio Seal. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I mean, Rachel. He, uh, you know, Rachel. She she uses Minx as her backup. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, whatever. We, on we always use a closure device. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Closure device. Did well, you? Are. Yeah. Well, you got to in the outpatient setting. Like, <laughs> you can't have them sitting around for six hours. Yeah. All right, well, great. So tell us about, so it's femoral access. Tell us, you know, uh, sheaths, catheters, wires, what do you, how do you approach sure. it? Yeah, just a, a regular short five French sheath. What I like to do as a trick to try and save contrast is, so we'll use like a sauce catheter. I'll go over the bifurcation and then I'll angle the C arm um, to uh, about 15 degrees RAO. Um, so then, you know, kind of know what's anterior. Yeah. And then I'll use that as my roadmap while the sauce is down that, um, that iliac. And then I kind of fish around for maybe, a, I'll give it a minute, somewhere between like, you know, L2 and L4, just to, just to see if it'll catch it. And I'd say 80% of the time I can catch it. If yeah. not, no big deal. You do a run. Um, but that's a way where you can save contrast. Get into the IMA. So when you're doing the IMA run, you want to include the the your, the tip of your catheter. Like it's it's tempting to say, oh, let's go all the way down to see the hemorrhoids. Most patients, you're not going to be able to see everything all the way down on the on the um, base catheter run. But you don't want to run into issues with like dissection, not being able to see yeah. the tip of your catheter with the yeah. IMA. Especially in older patients, they can have like plaque there or stenosis. Oh, yeah. So tiny it's, IMAs. It's not, it's, yeah. yeah, it's not worth that that risk. So do the base catheter run. And that run is actually very important because you're going to get a more physiologic assessment of like the inflow from the middle rectals. So you do that run, 
you may see a middle rectal at that time and you're like, oh, well, I'm probably going to have to go treat that. Sometimes you don't see them on the base catheter run, but uh, you can, you'll, they'll come up when you select, super select or select the superior rectal artery. So what I'll do next is we'll take a 2-4 pro grape and we'd use a uh, GT double angle wire for this because you get a little bit more torqueability when you go up and over and have that 180 degree turn. But we'll do a run at the, the common superior rectal artery. So you, you're right up there with that 2-4 pro grade, do a run. There you'll be able to tell at that point which ones you're going to target. So okay. what you'll see is they should just be wisps of hair, like like wisp of hair. Teeny. That's how, yeah. how the blood vessels should look like. Um, but they'll oftentimes in these patients, they're going to be huge. Corks, they can be corkscrew or they can they can look pretty funky. Um, but you when you get super selective, oftentimes you'll see staining of that that hemorrhoidal cushion. Okay. Um, like hyperemic so, area. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Totally. Okay. And then what we use is about 500 micron beads um, when we're embolizing, and then behind it, microcoil somewhere between two millimeter, three millimeter coil. Like a little halal um, or something like that, or just yeah, pushable cook uh, cook coils or re- really whatever we have. Yeah. Um, but but um, teeny though. Yeah, something smaller. Okay. But we have them on, in stock because we're doing PAEs too. So like when you're coiling your rectal or some collateral going to the pedendal, then yeah. you want something small. What size beads are you using, did you say? Five, 500 micron. 500 yeah. micron, okay. Yeah. How much do you have to put in to, for, in to get, it seems like very little, right? That's a great question. Yeah, so it's really just like filling the hub. Like I don't even inject the beads. I just fill the hub with a little bit of beads and then flush it through, ah. and like gently flush it through. Yeah. Really the, the, so to take a step back, this is, this helps more with internal hemorrhoids than external hemorrhoids because of where we're treating, right? So external hemorrhoids are usually supplied mostly from the inferior rectal arteries, yeah. which also supply the skin. So that's why you kind of hesitant to treat those inferior rectal arteries when, when externals are their, their predominant symptom. But so what will determine when would I use beads or when I wouldn't use beads? If I can't get distal enough and there's going to be too much collateral embolization there, I, I'll just do the coil and not the beads. But oftentimes, most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, you're able to get distal enough where you can administer the beads and then just put the coil behind it. Okay. And th- and that's it. And you're done, basically. Well, yeah. But there, there, so there's usually a <laughs> bunch of them. I'd say... Uh, I'd say on average, we're treating somewhere between three and six blood vessels. Okay. So, you, so, and, and it's dynamic too. So while you're doing the procedure, like you, you use your initial run as like your roadmap or, your, it, you know, what you're basing your decisions off of, but things can change. New, new formations can open up. Like you can see a middle rectal after you embolize this because the, now the flow is coming from there. You're like, oh, I didn't think I had to treat a middle rectal, but now it looks like it's very prominent when I'm injecting here, it's lighting up over there. Um, so some of it is like a, an art form, like you may see it and it's it's a, like a tiny wisp and I'll just be like, I'll leave it alone. But if they have some recurrence or, or they don't do as well as I suspect, I'll keep that in my back of my mind. Like, yeah, they probably have a middle rectal that's significantly contributing. Do you ever have to go yeah. back in or retreat? If, let's say there's symptoms yeah. of, yeah. How, how often yeah. does that it, happen? It's not that often. I'd say it's probably less than 20%, maybe, I don't know, 15, 10%. Um, what but, do you see when you go back in when that happens? So it, it, so I just did a redo yesterday and it was, it was interesting actually. So one, a new, so one was, it, it wasn't, you know, failure of treatment. There was one that formed a new one formed so you could see all the coils and then there's just this new blood vessel that was there so he was a year out this is new blood vessel that was here um so we treated that one and it was fine but anytime it's a redo i always double check the uh, middle rectals and he actually had another prominent middle rectal which may have not been seen the day we initially did it so middle rectals are key if you have to do a redo you you you, you want to check everything um so and it takes you know five minutes to check each one is uh, i know you guys are doing a lot of studies on this is, is neovascularity like something that you guys are looking at as part of your you know volume the large volume of cases you guys are doing well i what we're looking at is how does the anatomy because we have we have a paper that types out we have a proposed type anatomy uh, classification 
how does the anatomy play into leading to treatment failures or reduce? And it, it, the middle rectals, like I said, play a key role. So if, if I'm just getting into this, I would probably check the middle rectals on all of them, like, you know, just to get your bearings. Uh, and see what's normal and what's not normal. So IMA, you have the superior rectals, and there's usually there, that's where there's somewhere between three to six blood vessels that you're likely going to treat. And then the middle rectals come off the pudendal about off the internal iliac about midway. So they'll come off about midway. And then the inferior rectals will come off, you know, about two thirds or three quarters of the way da- off that pudendal. Um, so oftentimes you do your pudendal run. Uh, internal pudendal run, you'll be able to see that middle rectal, and you don't necessarily have to select it if it's if it's tiny, but if it's big, you'll see it, you'll, you'll you'll see it almost right away. So for that, for my middle rectal run, it's almost like doing a PAE. So I'll I'll you you can put them into like um you know ipsilateral oblique about 30, 35 degrees, and that will open everything up, um, and you'll be able to see. Uh, there is a trick that I do use where I use the same roadmap if I lit, lit it up for the superior rectals and just try to select, see, it's almost like a game, but you try to select the hypo off of that other roadmap you did with the superior rectals. Um, so you save contrast that way. But if, if, if you're just getting into it, I would just do another run when you get select the hypos. So is your algorithm that you follow basically starting out with IMA, because you know on every case you're going to be embolizing the superior rectals, right? And then, is that the case or no? Usually, oh, I won't never say always, but most of the time you're treating superior rectals because this this goes back to the anatomy paper. I had a case the other day, was a, it was this week actually, where they had no superior rectal supply and all the supply going to the hemorrhoidal cushion was actually coming from one side of a middle rectal where it just like draped over and supplied and you see an enhancement of that cushion. So what I'll use is a line of demarcation if you to just make it more objective if you're just getting into it. Instead of just saying, oh, you see, you see the staining of the hemorrhoidal cushion, it should be going below the level of the pubic symphysis, the, the blood vessel. So if it's not going below the level of the pubic symphysis or extending it all below there, then it's probably not contributing much. So treatment. IMA, select IMA first, check your, your superior rectals, which it's going to be the one branch going straight down the IMA, going down to the pelvis. And then if you see something or there's like a paucity of blood vessels on one side, then you go internal iliac and off the anterior division of the internal iliac, you have um, the pudendal, which then has a branch about midway, which is the middle rectal that you could potentially treat. You may see something supplying from that inferior rectal, but I I would not treat the inferior rectal primarily. S- there has been occasions where we did treat inferior rectals where they didn't do well and we brought them back and we ended up coiling, just coiling and not um, giving beads or particles. And they actually did well. But I would, I would not make that like a broad statement that you could do that for everyone. So it's a kind you, of a case by case thing. Okay. So you tend not to, and that's just because of the ri- there's risks associated with that. The or supply to the skin. Yeah, I got it. The, the, got the it. supply to the skin. Got yeah. it. Got it. Okay. So all right. So that that's that's super helpful to clarify because let's say you like su- on your initial IMA run, everything looks great. The superior rectals, you see them bilaterally contributing to the hemorrhoids. Do you still go and look at your middle hemorrhoidal, or do you just call it a day and say? I'm good. Usually I will call it a day if they're pretty prominent, but yeah. now that's gotten into just me doing a lot of these and I can kind of, you know, if I'm pushing hard enough and I don't backfill any of these, cause there usually is some type of backfill or some type yeah. of connection, then I'll leave it alone. But in the beginning I was checking all of them. Uh-huh. And I still probably check, I'd say more than half, probably like 75%. Okay. I still check, but you don't, you don't always, you don't always. That's sort of a gestalt thing that's, it's yeah. based off case by case and depending on what you see on your initial IMA and, and blue. okay. All right. Yeah. So that that's, goes back to the art to it, right? It sounds like you're using basic bread and butter tools, right? Stuff that we use for every embo case, something that might, we would even use for GI bleed, right? But it's really knowing the anatomy. It sounds like knowing the anatomy to a T and, and there's variability with every patient. So th- it sounds like those are the key things like to, to avoid recurrences, knowing the anatomy and also 
making sure that you're not missing anything, knowing what it's supposed to look like when there when there are hemorrhoids that are being fed by the superior and middle. Is there any sort of published, you know, because I know, you know, Sunny did this obviously with prostates, with all the variability in anatomy. Have you guys done anything like that with like a library, for example, of vascular, you know, variabilities? Do you guys have anything like yes. that? Yep. So we, so at SIR, I presented our uh, classification where we had 176 patients okay. of different, we, we just typed their anatomy. Yeah. Um, just saying, you know, what types we, we proposed a, a classification system. Okay. And so what we said was type one would be bilateral supply from the superior rectal arteries. Yeah. Type two would be unilateral superior rectal artery on one side and unilateral middle rectal on the other side. Type three would have been bilateral superior rectal arteries and one contributing middle rectal artery. So you have both. Yeah. You have both. Uh, type four would be bilateral superior rectal arteries and then bilateral middle rectal arteries. And then the last type, type five, would be just middle rectal arteries. So nothing from the superior rectal artery. Okay. Perfect. That's going to be a central information for people wanting to do this. So any, you know, we talked about non-target embolization. We talked about, you know, older patients having the risk of dissection, especially within IMA. Any other kind of complications that you've seen in, in large volume of cases you guys have done that you, you try to avoid or can warn people about? So most, vast majority of patients don't experience much pain at all afterwards. But some patients that I've noticed, they, with really big hemorrhoids and we get an emboliz- we do the embolization, they may have some discomfort afterwards. Typically, it, it's it's it, it resolves. It always resolves, like in a few days. But in that interim, I'll tell them, you know, take an NSAID, and then we'll I'll also uh, prescribe like Emla cream or topical, um, like lidocaine or something like that to help with the pain just for those couple days. But that that can happen. So I wouldn't freak out if they start if they say, you know, oh, I have some discomfort I didn't have before the procedure in this rectal area. But oftentimes those patients I'll bring in because we had had patients where had nothing to do with the hemorrhoids and they had a fissure that just incidentally had a fissure and that you, you want to, you know, educate them in a different way. But, um, yeah, so you can have, you can have, um, some discomfort afterwards and typically it's with the larger ones. Okay. And so that's a nice segue into post-procedure care. How soon are you seeing these patients afterwards? They come yep. for a follow-up clinic visit. Walk us through that. Yeah, so we see we talk to them one month, four months, and then actually we also follow them at a year. So we, it's probably, um, I mean, it, it's probably overkill and uh, not necessarily overkill, but you lose some of the patients at a year because they're doing well and they're just like, I don't, I don't, I don't want to keep this appointment. But yeah, at a month you should notice for sure the improvement in bleeding, um, discomfort, itching. They may notice improvement in the size and the prolapse at that point too. Um, but sometimes for that, it'll take even all the way up to that four month mark to really notice the improvement in prolapse uh, or, or the size of the hemorrhoids. But bleeding, discomfort, itching, that they shouldn't, you, you should have a good idea that first month that they're improving there. If they're not, then a, a flag should go up in your mind saying, well, do we get them all? I may do a shorter term follow up at that point if it's like kind of gray where it's like, well, the bleeding's a little bit better. I'll say, okay, let's follow you up in like four weeks as opposed to, you know, waiting another three months to talk to you. And then at, at that point, I'll kind of make my decision. If they say, hey, the bleeding isn't better at all, or if the bleeding's worse than before, then I'll bring them in like right away. And and that has happened before where the bleeding actually was worse, where we treated what looked like, you know, was the predominant blood vessels, but a new one just arose afterwards and it was huge. It can happen. It's, it's, it, that's a rare circumstance, but that that's why, yeah, just follow up with these patients is important because you want to ensure that you're successfully treating them. Yeah. And, and also, you know, probably communicating with the, the GI team, right? And, and the referral or colorectal team. How, how does that work? So they'll follow up with their GI as, as they would if they had already had a colonoscopy, then, you know, the, they, they, will stay on their regular schedule. It's not like you need a colonoscopy afterwards. Uh, and really, it's it, it's as needed. So if their symptoms go away, they don't necessarily have to follow with them. And, and part B of that question is, as you guys are building this, have you gotten any resistance from our colleagues in GI or colorectal? 
GIs are actually they're they're usually pretty happy to offload yeah. these patients. These aren't patients <laughs> yeah. that they're like that they fighting see. for. Yeah, yeah. And and honestly, I thought the colorectal surgeons would be more adverse or you know, give give more of a pushback. But all the colorectal surgeons that I've spoken to in person, they've they've all been welcoming of this and as some treatment on this this disease process or this spectrum of the disease. So they would agree that probably type fours is not the best treatment option because you're not going to necessarily be able to shrink them down as much as you would need to. But, you know, someone who has bleeding and they're requiring blood transfusion or they're anemic and, you know, it it's a type two or you like, it doesn't make sense for them to put them through that, that painful surgery. recovery. Yeah. 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 Um, great. And, and so I'm going to get into final thoughts as we wrap up the hour here, Alex, but you know, I know that you and Sonny and the TNR and the whole team are putting a lot of, um, you guys are doing a lot of these cases. You're putting a lot of good data out there, uh, trying to educate everybody on, on these procedures. Any resources or papers you recommend that are kind of a good starting point for those who are considering adding this as a service line? I think it's important to know the literature because if you're, if you're going to go speak to gastroenterologists, you should know the literature. The knowing about how this came about, I don't think that's as, as important. Knowing like Doppler guided ligation is basically why we we, we, we say that this would probably work. Um, and Vidal started this, I think, in France. But that part to me, I, I don't think is as important if you're just an IR going to a gastroenterologist. I think being able to just show outcomes saying, look, these patients improve in bleeding, um, they improve in um, Golier prolapse score, they improve in. Uh, itching, discomfort, all, all the symptoms associated with hemorrhoids. Um, if you can go and bring that to, and we have that data, we have our outcomes data. It's, that's what Sunny presented at SIR, which is the largest cohort of patients. Um, but yeah, if you can bring that data to, to gastroenterologists or even colorectal surgeons, that would go a long way because I think the results is, is more important. Yeah. Is this something you guys also cover at the annual stream conference or is that still focused more on PAE? Yeah, so no, I, I spoke, uh, I, I presented on that at Stream last year. It's it's going to be, we're going to talk about it again on, at Stream this year too. So if Great. you want to learn more, it's a nice free plug. Oh, it's got to get uh, a Stream plug in. Yeah, <laughs> let's get a Stream plug. Cool, Ari, man. Ari and Sonny do a great job there. It's a yeah. fun conference. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm still shocked I haven't been able to go to one. But I appreciate those guys, you know, always cheering on back to what Stream. Happy to hand out hoodies over there too. Oh, yeah. um, they're the best hoodies. That's what we were talking <laughs> about it at SIR, the best hoodies. Although I'm starting to get jealous of y'all's uh, swag. I really like that North Face. Yeah, Sonny's, Sonny's had to step up his game, you know? <laughs> That's right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Um, looking forward to having you on again soon to to maybe take a deeper dive, whether it be hemorrhoid or, or maybe we talk about one of the more ortho procedures like GAE as a, that's evolving shoulder and both, you know, I know you guys yeah, are be cranking awesome. those out as well. I, one last question before we wrap up. I think a lot of people, sure. myself included, are curious in terms of level of difficulty relative to PAE, what would you, where would you, you know, let's say PA is yeah. nine out of 10. Where would you put yeah. hemorrhoid? I would probably, I would probably put this at like a six. Yeah. And, and the, the six is not even necessarily the technique. It's more so, you know, interpreting what what you're seeing in one to treat other areas yeah but technique wise i think people could get into it because the learning curve probably isn't as steep um but then also it's an underserved population that patients don't have many options so it's a that's a place where any ir can really make some good inroads yeah like you said at the beginning there's a l- large volume of patients that a lot of times like you said don't have gr- great options they don't want to go through surgery and so i love that you guys have developed this and continue it continues to evolve and Appreciate you coming on the show, bud. Uh, it, was, it was a blast. I look forward to coming on again. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Talk to you next week. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, 
Nick Shellcross. And Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 